Okay. If you could just say your full name into the mic. Mia Jackson. Mia Jackson. Mia Jackson. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Joel. So you have achieved a goal all comedians strive for, and that is transitioning to being full-time. Yes, Joel, I have transitioned to full-time. That is the dream of a lot of people. You're right. And how's that working out for you? You know what, Joel? There have been some lonely nights. Um, <clears throat> times like this, I want to quote um, Langston Hughes, uh, life for me ain't been no crystal stare. But no, it's actually been it's been interesting. It's been a, um, there's a part of me that feels like fly by the seat of my pants kind of thing. And then there's another part of me that feels like, oh, there's an amount of preparation involved in it because it's, it's one of the things where, you know, I went from always having a job to where I knew, you know, every two weeks, I get paid this certain amount of money. So now it's like, well, you might get paid this week <laughs> or or you might not. Or somebody might say we're going to send you a check and you might not get it until three weeks later when other things were due. So mm -hmm. it's been an interesting transition just to, you know, it's one of those things because for years I used to go, oh, I don't know if I can ever do it. I don't know if I can ever be a full-time comic. And then when it's kind of forced upon you, you're like, okay, I guess I can do it. So <laughs> that's what happened. Yeah. Was there a specific event that made you feel ready? Why, yes, there was, Joel. There was a specific event. So like I said, for years I've, I'd, I'd had a job. I had a day job for a long time. I was a corporate trainer at a company that I don't want to name because they, they don't get no shout outs. They don't deserve me to mention who they are. Um, but uh, I worked for this one company for years, and um, it, it got to a point where we both almost kind of came to a mutual. It was funny because, I mean, of course, they don't know this, but I'd actually said to myself, I was like, I'm going to quit this job by June the 1st. And I was like, I don't care what happens. I'm going to quit. Mm -hmm. And then I guess maybe they picked that up out of the universe and went, we're actually going to make you quit before then. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, we had a new manager and they came in and they were just like, hey, you know what? we think you should be in another department. And I go, I don't think I should be here at all. And mm -hmm. then it was like, well, but you've been here for so many years, you should stay. And then I just go, or you could fire me. And they were just like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And I go, or yes, you could. <laughs> and that's, and so they were really shocked. I think people were surprised that I asked to be terminated, but I mean, I know the game a little bit. I mean, my um, mother's in HR. So, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been in that situation at other jobs before. My mom was like, you're going to be fine. So, I asked to leave and they agreed and I agreed and then I just left and things just kind of went crazy after that. Like it was a lot of cool stuff that happened in a very short amount of time and I don't think those things would have happened had I still been working there. So. Well, you were there, I mean, almost eight years. Yeah, I guess. almost. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, seven and a half years just about. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a long time at a comfortable job I mean mm -hmm. yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't even because I didn't have anything saved at all I was just like I'm gonna quit I was like <laughs> I'm gonna leave by June 1st because it's gonna come to that point anyway and 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 I and for years I would always I'd even do things where I would write termination letters and I'd be like I'm gonna just save this and then I'd be like okay I'm just gonna change the date because I'm not gonna leave just yet because things have gotten better so okay we're not gonna leave this day and I'm like all right but I mean they, they like I said it was it was it's one of those things where if <clears throat> when you make decisions or if you're kind of waffling on something sometimes somebody will make that decision for you I had already been putting into put it into the atmosphere and into mm -hmm. the universe into the world just kind of going I don't want to be here like I don't want to be at this place and there's there's and it's, it doesn't matter how many times I lie in meetings and pretend like this is the greatest place on earth oh my god no I really no I see what you're saying and I agree with that and no I no you know what when I go back to my class and train them things are going to be amazing I agree and there are only so many times I could tell that same lie until the light started slowly leaving my eyes <laughs> and then that's when I was like and, you know, I just think it was one of the things where it was, okay, well, you've been saying it, and now it's happening. And you might not have, and, and it would have been nice to have been like, boom, I got you, I got control of this. But at the same time, it was just like, all right, I didn't need it to happen anyway, so 
you kind of helped make that decision for me, and now I got to do what I got to do. So, has coming from the corporate world helped you navigate the business side of comedy? Are you finding parallels between the two? Yeah, there are parallels with um with with corporate and with with comedy, and I think one of the biggest parallels that I realized for myself is that I'm a terrible business person. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm really awful and I'm like oh this is what they meant at work when I got written up oh because Mia doesn't like to meet deadlines Mia has trouble <laughs> meeting deadlines and I'm like oh this is what they mean but but in comedy though I actually if it's, if it's stuff I have to turn in by a certain date or do certain things I actually do follow directions with that because that's something that I want to do but there, there were things that I picked up in that world that you know helped me as far as like when I'm sending emails to people you know just knowing how to send a professional email without sounding like an asshole, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, just being like, hi, I'm Mia Jackson, blah, 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 as opposed to, hey, I want to work at your club, you know. <laughs> so just kind of putting stuff together. And um, and then there's that part, that structure from having a, you know, because if you go from I do the same thing at the same time every day to, oh, I don't do anything until the night. Oh, what do I do from this time that I've been up for years at the same time every day until night? So there's a part of it where, and I'm getting better with it, but but just the structure part of looking at a schedule and going, because I used to live and die by my work schedule. It would be my calendar was color coded, and it was if I'm if it's yellow, I'm on a phone call. If it's this, I'm in a meeting. If I'm doing this, is this thing? Wow. So that that's so I kind of have I'm trying to incorporate those things into my life schedule now to go. Okay, well you're supposed to have this call with this person on this day, or if you're gonna block out time to write, it needs to be. This needs to already be in your schedule. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm not there yet, but it's happening. Like a literal so, calendar on the wall. Yeah, like a, yeah. I actually keep an I keep an actual um, and I actually picked that up from um, one of my BFFs, comedian Landry. Um, but just keeping a big, huge uh, dry erase calendar on the wall. So anytime I have a gig, I write the gig down on the wall, and then I and my own little system is well, if it's paid, I put it in black because I'm in the black. Mm -hmm. But if it's an open mic, I mean, I put it in red. I mean, just to say, like, I'm not getting paid for it, but it's also I'm building up to to black, basically. Mm -hmm. So I put all that kind of stuff in there. You know, if I'm going on vacation, that kind of thing. I, I mean, which isn't technically vacation anymore, but I put those kind of things in there, personal things, and then I also, you know, try to keep it in my actual phone calendar, too, to just keep up with what's going on in life. But that was something I picked up from the from my um job to try to keep myself somewhat organized yeah definitely on the organizational side what about branding side because clearly you have you have a vision for your branding I mean if you go on your website miajackson.com I mean there's there's new pictures of you there's bright this colors this is true you pitching yourself is like the likable girl next door I am aren't I it's so weird you know mm -hmm. and this this is what kind of happened so how how does how did I brand myself? Because I think for years, I don't think I really um, I don't know if I really even had it. like the like the whole branding thing to me is something that you kind of heard about in the past ten years or so where people are like you got to brand you you got to brand yourself. <laughs> what is your brand? And then I'd be like. I am Mia Jackson, and I don't know what that means. And then I'm thinking, oh, okay. Well, people are saying you need to. You need. It's basically marketing. You know, if you think about um, what was it? I was listening to some podcast once, and I remember it was this really great quote, and I cannot remember who said it. But this, um, it was some. It was a businesswoman, and she said this thing where she goes, "Branding is the space you take up in people's mind." And I remember going, mm. "Oh." that is important sounding and that makes a lot of sense. And, and it's like, what is my brand? So for years, I kind of think I just was kind of floating along like, Oh, who am I? I don't know what I'm doing. And then, um, it just so happened like with these, um, this bright little thing, like, you know, these pictures and stuff, but like a lot of feedback I get from people all the time is they're like, Oh, you remind me of my friend. You remind me of this person I know. Or, mm -hmm. and I and I was telling somebody before. I usually get invited to people's houses a lot after shows. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I don't know if because they think I'm going to work for them, um, because that's been asked before. But um, sometimes it's hey, I want to hang out with you. So I was like, hey, maybe I'm kind of a girl next door. Maybe I'm that kind of I'm your fun friend. And so the um, it just so happens that my um. My boo or bay, as the people in the streets call call it, he is a mm -hmm. um, professional photographer, and so, um, so he was just like, let's do 
cool, fun promotional shots. Let's do some promo shots that kind of is like, what kind of person do you think you are? And he's like, you're fun, you're you're lively, people like you, so let's make sure your pictures kind of say that same thing. So they're all very bright and very, hi, I'm Mia, mm -hmm. and look at me, and I have a green background, so yay, I'm you know that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that's that's where it comes from, from just kind of a a vision of hey, I think I'm bright and lively. Let's show that in these pictures. And did that start within the past year of you going full time? Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, and I and I took some. I mean, because I've you know, obviously I've been doing comedy for a long time, so I've had snapshots, and you know, I've had pictures of me before, but you know, just your standard, like, hey, this is me smiling, and I might have my hands under my chin, and that looks like an Olin Mills shot, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, and I've had, you know, head shots, but like, this is the first time I've really had, like, just amazing, lovely, or as the children say, dope, um, mm -hmm. head shots, or promo shots, you know, so it's been really fun to go, oh, I get to explore this cool, silly, you know, side of things, but in a visual um, manner, you know, so. Do you find yourself writing jokes with this brand in mind now? No, not really. I mean, I think, um, I think, I think the way I write, I think it's always kind of been that, um, this little, you know, I'm a silly, um, kind of fun, ridiculous person, but I think that, that kind of, um. Because some comics have a certain persona or brand on right. stage, and then the jokes, will just be geared towards that. Right, and right. And that could be a pigeonhole creatively. Right, right, yeah. And so I, I just think, I, I mean, I really just try to, whatever I think is funny or whatever I feel like, you know, I want to give to the people, you know, I'm like, oh, I think that's a good idea. I don't know if this necessarily, like, if this is if this is a Mia Jackson signature thing, but I just go, oh, I think I like this, and I'll just see what, where it goes. You mentioned earlier you've quit your full-time job and became a comedian just over a year ago and already a lot has been happening. Right. Is this on just getting booked wise or television or me, fan base? Let me tell you something, Joel. Um, you're the wind beneath my wings, first of all. But um, yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of things. It's been, um, so, so <clears throat> when I went, Full time in April of 2014. So one of the first things that happened, I'd actually taped a spot on Nick Mom um, mm -hmm. the year before, and mine was still in the can. There were other people who had taped with me, and their episodes had aired. And I was just like, oh, I guess mine just won't air. But no, no big deal. It was almost like a week or two after I no longer had my day job, I get an email from the Nick Mom people going, "Hey, your set's gonna air." A month from now and I'm like what and I'm just like oh my god like this thing has been in the can for a year and mm -hmm. now it's gonna air and then um wow. maybe like a couple of weeks later I got a call from or I got an email from somebody from the AJC and they were just like hey you know there's this book that just came out about humor and they, they talk about Atlanta being you know a top comedy city and we know you're a comedian blah 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 can we interview you and then I go to the AJC and then the little you know, on the front page, the little square picture up top is my picture. And then on the, the inside of the article, it's a big, you know, picture of, of me. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then maybe a couple mm -hmm. of weeks later, something else is in the AJC with my picture, like, on the front page of the living section. So I'm like, where is this coming from? Wow. And even people from my old job, they were just like, did you read this in the newspaper? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> and so, but yeah, but now, but gigs that I had to turn down before, I could actually say, oh, well, yeah, I'm available that entire week. Like, I don't have to, mm -hmm. you know, whereas before I'd have to do stuff where I'd go, okay, well, I have a job, so I can really only take a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And even if I take that Friday and Saturday, Sunday gig out of town, I still have to negotiate and, and you know, almost beg people with my schedule, like, hey, is it okay if I leave Friday at 2 because I need to go out of town so I could make it to, you know, Chattanooga or something like that. Or um, or it would be, oh, well, I can work a full weekend, but it's got to be a weekend here in town. But no, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was too often where I could go, oh, I'm going to be gone Tuesday through, through Saturday or Tuesday through Sunday. So now those gigs I couldn't take before, I could now, I could now take. Or I could do something in the middle of a week like, hey, can you, can you do this one nighter on a Wednesday and we'll fly you out? Oh, well, sure. So mm -hmm. now, now I can do those things. And then another, um, you know, big thing was the, audition and um all the stuff that happened with uh last comic standing so mm -hmm. that was um 
that process started in September of um, 2014. So, you know, and it was the, you know, and even with that, it was like, well, those are things where if I had my job, I, yeah, I could still audition, but could I have been gone for a week and some change in LA? Probably not, you know? So mm -hmm. it was just, you know, it was just amazing just how things just kind of went back to back to back. And I, I I was telling someone, I said, this might be a ridiculous analogy, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> I um I said, it was almost like my life before was um water in the sink, just some stagnated ass, dirty ass dish water just mm -hmm. in the sink and did when it was just like, when you know, when my job was like, hey, we don't want you to work here. And I'm like, I don't want to be here. It's like somebody just pulled that plug and all that stuff just was, you know, and it was just like, and it's like, I'm free, I'm clear, and now I can just do things, you know. And even though there's still the financial aspect of things where sometimes I'm like, oh, I got to make this decision. I don't know if I want to spend the money on this, but mm -hmm. uh, I should try to do it. But it's been... It's been the right thing, you know. It's been the right thing to do, and um, as many times as I sit back and go, "Oh man, how am I gonna, how am I gonna make it this month?" Then something pops up, and and things just seem to be okay. Are all these opportunities coming from just independent, or are you having representation facilitate some of these opportunities? Um, a little bit of both. So, um, you know. A lot of it, a lot of the opportunities, and that's the thing I'd like to make sure that I say to the people out there, um, mm -hmm. and I just got in my dramatic voice, a lot of it, and, this, and that's another thing I did pick up from the corporate world that's very important, is building relationships, and I know it sounds like one of those, you know, oh, that's cliche, blah, 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 but it is really important because I remember when I first started, one comedian, um, he had told me, he said, Mia, work gets work, and I went. You're right. And he was like, you're going to find that a lot of your gigs are going to come from other comedians. So um, even with the whole, you know, with me doing the audition for Last Comic Standing, it was because I worked so much at the punchline. You know, I had that relationship established with them mm -hmm. when they got, hey, we're going to do this audition. Can you recommend some people? They put me on the on the audition. Um, then there was um, like, but then like with some of the college gigs and things that I have, like I do actually have a college agent. So with that, you know, they, you know, hey, Mia, we're, there's going to be a, you know, showcase in this city or this day. Do you want to submit? Okay, great. And then I'll submit and stuff like that, you know. Um, so some of them have been kind of, you know, half and, and half, but um, a lot of it is just, you know, just relationships, people that I know and reaching out to people and, hey, remember I worked with you in such and such, or I worked at this club before. You got any, you know, availability? I love to do this gig, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing, so. And when you organize all these contacts, do you have a book of just comedian contacts? Um, I mean, just yeah, just my regular old email, you know, that kind of thing. Where just I have stuff saved from people I've contacted over the years, but I don't have an, an official. This is my comedian spreadsheet. Okay, because you yes. had a calendar. Spreadsheet. I do have a calendar, but yeah, most of that stuff, like I said, it's just contacts I've saved over the years, just from my regular life. Mm -hmm. you know, so. So the last comic standing didn't come from an agent or anything. That came from just yeah. It came from the the like I said the punchline recommended me mm -hmm. and I went and did the audition and um, at the punchline I the pun yeah at the punchline and that was in September of last year and then I got the call back to um, where you would depending on where you lived in the country you would either go to L A or you would go to New York and so I got the call for the call back and then I'm all prepared to leave for the call back and then they were like actually just going to invite you to the top 100 so a lot of people so I really had a good experience because there were other people I knew um like I met people who taped with me and they were like oh I had to, eat, I had to, eat, I had to audition two and three times you know and it wow. was like wow so it was really you know cool that I got to go right to the to the top 100 but yeah that was without having management or anything like that so well you've performed on tv a few times yeah but what was your preparation like for Last Comic Standing? Let me tell you, Joel, I have never worked harder in my life than I have for Last Comic Standing. And I really need to make sure I incorporate that moving forward because I I got so tired of hearing my voice. And it was, but I mean, I, I was just like, I have to bust my ass for this. I was like, I'm not going to embarrass myself on national television. I'm like, regardless of, let's say I get on there and I don't advance. Then, you know, my mindset was, at least if I go out, it's got to be on a set I'm not embarrassed about. So, 
from the time that I knew I'd actually, you know, hey, you're going to be on the show, um, I recorded every set. Mm -hmm. it, whether it was five minutes, if I was on the road and I was featuring or if I was closing, I'm recording every single set, playing that set back and going, okay, this works, this works, cut this out, cut this out. And then it was almost to the point of where when I knew that, you know, how much time we had to do on the show, okay, well, if they tell me how to do three and a half minutes, that's probably going to be about two minutes and 45 seconds for TV because people are, because those crowds are so hot and they get so hyped up that you'll get applause breaks on stuff that you never gotten applause breaks on before mm. when you go out and like, hey, I'm Mia. <laughs> and you're just like, I've never gotten an applause break on my name. So you have to be prepared and you're just kind of like, whoa, I, I got to tell some jokes right now. Mm -hmm. Hush, I got to keep going. So, but it was just really, I mean, listening to my set, um, going back and transcribing stuff and changing stuff. I mean, I was changing stuff up until the last minute, until like right before I taped. Um, my boyfriend was real helpful with it. I mean, he kind of drove me crazy during the um, process. Like, I wanted to, I wanted to strangle him. He knows it. He wanted to strangle me because <laughs> he was just like, Mia, you've got to stay on task. But, it, but in the long run, it was very helpful. Even though I wanted to slap him, but he would he would call and we would just be on the phone and he go, okay, run your set run your set to me. Like, uh -huh. we wouldn't even have, we'd be like, hey, so how's your day today? My day is great, but I need you to run your set. And I'd be on the phone running my set, just talking to him going, okay, time me, time me, time me. And so he's timing my set. Okay, that clocked in at four minutes. You got to cut out a word. Okay, that clocked in at three minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, this clocked in at blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, is that enough? Is that enough? And mm -hmm. so it was timing everything, taking stuff out. Um, I mean, anytime, like I said, anytime I went to an open mic, I would go and play the, you know, play my material back and go, okay, that joke took one minute and 30 seconds. And I know I want to do this joke on the show. So will I be able to keep that one in and also do this joke? So it was just a lot of writing, rewriting and listening to myself and then just going, I don't know how people want to hear my voice because it's terrible. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I really, I mean, it was, it was a lot of preparation, but I mean, I felt like. I felt like I came out a, a better comic as a result because I was like, man, I should probably do this all the time and not just for TV shows. Like, I'd probably be mm -hmm. really good if I did this on a regular basis. So so you don't do that on a regular basis now? Um, so Not as much as I was. Like, I still record, but, like, whereas before I would record and go, I listen to this as soon as my set is over now. I'm like, nah, I'll listen to it in two days. I know it was funny. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But it... It is it's it's something that I should incorporate and I would say to anybody that's, you know, just even if you aren't preparing for TV, it's just a good thing to do because you might say something, you might um, you know, it might be one extra sentence that you're like, Man, I never thought to even put that in that joke before and now I got something or something might happen in the audience and you're like, This is something I can use and so I mean, there was a joke I've been doing the same way for a long time. And then right before the show, I, um, uh, cause another person I ran my set with, uh, was, was, uh, Landry. Mm -hmm. And so we're FaceTiming and he's like, all right, run your set. And then I just go, okay. And I'm doing the set. And he's like, have you ever thought about taking this thing out and then closing it this way? And I'm just like, oh my God, it's like the day, the day of, like I'm taping that night. And then wow. I just go, that's actually really good. I'm like, but my comedic instinct is going that might work. And then I closed that joke just like that. And I was just like, boom, like, oh, it was such a great, and I've been doing it now in the club since then. I'm just like, why haven't I, why did I never do it that way before? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of work that I should probably do all the time. <laughs> Could you see other comics like preparing backstage and that intensely? Yeah. Like I, like there were some people, it was, it was interesting. You saw people who were loud and playing the whole time and just kind of, all over the place and then mm -hmm. you saw other comments just kind of off in the corner and just mouthing stuff to themselves over and over you know and then you got some people who were just talking just out of nervousness like we're having a conversation I'm here but I'm not really here I'm mm -hmm. here but I'm not here and right. then um, but yeah a lot of lot of lot of mouthing of things and a lot of I'm gonna go off to this corner by myself and look at my notes so yeah you could see that a lot yeah I don't know if anybody went as crazy as I did though I'm sure they did but being there it was a lot of mouthing <laughs> And the, from a competitive standpoint, I mean, was there a nice 
community, or was it all like every man for himself? You know what? I th- I think there I think there might have been a little bit of both. I mean, it was it was this thing. Bec- there was the the experience of oh man, we're all here. Like this is this is really cool. So you know, you would meet people and talk to people. And be like, hey man, I hope this goes great. And then you meet other people who are just like, I am ready to take over the world. You mm-hmm. know how amazing this will be if I win. <laughs> Not you, but I, I win the show. And I'm just like, chill out. Like, it's, you need to relax. Like, mm-hmm. it is not that serious. It's serious, but you, sir, need to calm yourself down. You know, so you would see a little bit of that, you know, and then, um, but for the most part, to me, it felt very, it, it was a positive experience. I mean, people, you know, there were obviously people who were probably secretly going around like, I want to win, and I'm going to win, and I think you should go in there with that attitude. But, um Everybody seemed to be pretty supportive. Hey, where are you from? Where are you out of? Oh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. I've never been down to Atlanta. Or, hey, if you come to my city? Some people, I still, you know, we still text and keep in touch. Like, hey, blah, blah, blah. Most of the time it was, did you get your check yet? But, um, <laughs> but you know, just kind of keeping in touch and, you know, because we, you know, shared this unique experience at the same time. So, um, but there, there are people who are like, oh, I know we're going to work together one day. You know, so that was cool. And um, there was one comic I, who had done it the season before me and I contacted her and I was just like, hey, any advice? And then she was just like, look, make sure you get a damn good tape out of it. And she was like, that's what you want. And she was like, because you can't, you can't predict the outcome, you know. And, and that's another thing that I've learned over the years with comedy anyway. I mean, it's, it's very easy, I think, to go in and, and compare yourself to other people. I think it's very easy to go, well, how did this person get this thing and I didn't? Or how did this thing happen? Um, or if I go on this show, I've got to win. Because there were mm-hmm. people who left crying. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. There were people who left really, really disappointed. But, yeah, it would have been nice to have you know continued on. But at the same time, I was like, you know what? I know I got a good tape out of it unless they go back and add things in and take stuff out. But Mm -hmm. at the very least, I know that I performed well. And if they use the set that I did, which where I performed well, I think both times, then it's like, okay, well, now I have two sets that I could use to get more work and do other stuff. So that's kind of, you know, because now it's like, well, I can send you a clip besides this thing I did on YouTube, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that was kind of my thing was like, I just want to go get that good tape. I just want a good tape. Like that that was what I wanted and I feel like, you know, that's what's going to happen. Well, how does the high coming off last comic standing compare to you opening up for Chappelle or Amy Schumer? Um, it's a very it's god, it's such a different high because the you know, doing the Chappelle thing like gosh, it was just I can't even even now and then that was that's now been two years ago. Two years ago this, yeah, um, next month. It'll be wow. two years. And I just remember getting a call and going, what? Like, I'm hmm. I'm, I'm going to go do, because it was Marshall. Marshall from uh, Laughing School. Mm-hmm. That's who um, was like, hey, me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm in Target right now. I'm getting ready to go to a gig. And he's like, ah, oh, it's too bad. And he's like, what are you doing this weekend though? And I'm like, oh, I got another gig. And he goes, so you wouldn't want to open for Chappelle? I was like, okay, I'll cancel everything. I'm like, <laughs> absolutely. And so getting there, you know, it was like, that was this thing of, it was so unexpected to, you know, where to me it was like, all right, I'm just doing another show. But then at the end of it, it was just like, I just opened for Dave Chappelle. Like, mm-hmm. this is crazy. And then I, but I just felt like, you know, I still got more work to do. I'm still doing other stuff. And then, um, and because I, you know, the preparation for that was just, well, I've been doing comedy all this time. I'm just doing a set. But it was still like, this is Dave Chappelle. And then for, you know, Amy Schumer, it was just like, well, I've just been doing comedy all this time. And I'm opening for Amy Schumer. But, you know, it was just like, ooh, that thing happened. Like, that's cool. And then the high from the show, very different because it was just this build up for months and months, you know, going from September to mm-hmm. March and just being like, okay, this is going to happen. I mean, because it was, it was beyond just, performing it was also oh i'm going to the gym all the time i'm not eating carbs after four (laughs) i'm doing all this stuff because i was like i'm not gonna have a double chin on national television you know and it was like Mm -hmm. i've got want to look great i want to do all this stuff so it's just like i'm doing all this stuff to prepare and it's like you go i'm doing this step this step this step then the pinnacle is now i'm on the show Mm -hmm. and it is huge high and then afterwards you're like 
I do now? <laughs> do I keep going to the gym? Do I keep <laughs> do I keep writing jokes? Can I now eat carbs after four? Mm-hmm. You know, so there was that that experience of going. So that that was a that high was very like that drop was just pretty much like when it was over, it was so it was so intense. It was so intense to where when it was done, I just remember going. What do, what do I do now? Like, I didn't even know what to do for a few days. I was just like, okay, I got to go home and I got to get back on stage. And I think, I think I just need a break for a few days from comedy. I was like, I just need to calm down. Because like I said, the other shows, huge, huge experiences. I mean, it's Dave Chappelle, it's Amy Schumer. But like I said, it, to me, it was still like, okay, well, I'm going to go do a set. I'm just, I'm performing and... I performed, now the show's over, I go home. But this was just like, like I said, but it was that, I think it, those would have been different if I knew, if I knew in January of that year, oh, well, in June, you're going to be opening for Dave Chappelle, then it would have been, okay, I'm preparing, I'm preparing, I'm preparing. Mm-hmm. But it was just like, oh, well, it's this afternoon, you're going to be opening for Dave Chappelle tonight. It's just like, okay, I just, you know, game time. I just got to mm-hmm. go, I just got to go. But this was like building, 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 and then that release. But it was just a, it wasn't until I left that I was like, man, that was an intense experience like that was an intense experience but I mean for a few days I was just like I don't want to watch comedy Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear comedy I just need a few days of a break that is all I want so like coming down from that was a very it was a different coming down you know Mm -hmm. um but all I mean all great experiences but that one was just like so just involved Mm -hmm. so involved well, like with Last Comic Standing, were you able to be backstage with Chappelle and Amy and network a little bit, talk? Yeah, like with the um, with the Chappelle thing. Um, I mean, obviously he's Dave Chappelle, so he got his own huge green room that they allowed me to go into. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I, I was in my own green room that had a couch and a chair mm-hmm. and a mirror. Um, so I was like, hello, who else is this lucky? Um, and, uh, but, it, but later on during the night of uh, a friend of mine came and because she talks to everybody in the world, they were like, oh, the comedian's your friend. And like, well, why isn't she in here with us? And she was like, I think she's scared to come in here. And they were like, no, tell her to, tell her to come back. And so mm-hmm. I was in an green room with them and everybody's just hanging out and talking and he was just super cool. And then he's like, he's like, so who are you? Cause he came late and then I, and I go, Cause he saw me walking in the hall earlier, and he's just like, "Hey!" And I just go, "Hi!" And I didn't, I didn't even have the heart to be like, "I opened for you earlier." I'm just uh-huh. like, "I don't know how to go and say this to Dave Chappelle." Uh-huh. And so um, later, he was just like, "Now who are you?" And I go, "Oh, I go, I was the comic that um opened for you earlier tonight." And he was like, "Ow!" And he's like, "Come here, give me a hug." And he's like, "Thank you, thank you for doing that." And I'm wow. like, "Oh." <laughs> he's just like, nah, I appreciate it. He's like, cool. And so he's just like, all right. Because he was just like, why are you so quiet? And I'm like, you're Dave Chappelle. What am I supposed to be talking about? Nothing I say is going to be as hilarious as you say, you know. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but he was it was super cool. And um, just kind of, you know, it, it's, I don't know if you can, I mean, I, I'm i a difficult, I'm have a, I have a hard time networking with people in general. So for mm-hmm. me, it was just more like, I'm just glad to be invited to the party. I don't want to be like, hey, Dave, here's my number. Like, I wasn't that kind of person. But, right. um, but with Amy... I'd actually met her um, a few years ago at the punchline when I think it was around the time she maybe, um, it might've been one of her first times headlining at the punchline. And so this was when they would bring in a lot of different people to host, you know, the, hey, this person hosting eight o'clock on Friday, this person's hosting at 10. And this Mm -hmm. was just one of the nights where I happened to do both of the shows. And so when I came in, she was like, oh, she's like, cool. Nice, you know, nice to meet you. She's like, she goes, you're, you're cool. You're you're a cool person. She's like, because a lot of the people they've had coming here have been. She's like, people have been kind of cocky and had attitudes. And she was like, you just seem to be really like regular. And she's like, and you seem like a you're a comic. She's like, I can tell you're a comic. And I'm like, gee, thanks, wow. you know. And so, um, and then we had a <clears throat> a cool experience. Um, we met because um, there was another comic. I don't want to say his name, but he's an actor, and um, he burst into the club and uh, asked if he could do a guest spot. And they were like, well, you have to ask the headliner. So he comes in the, the green room with his um, friend. And then the friend is just like, oh, I saw you performing earlier. And I go, oh, okay, thanks. He's like, you're funny. And I go, okay, thanks. And then the friend is like, so um, I could get you pregnant. And I go, ah, I'm okay. I think I'm all right living a pregnant-free life. By, I don't even know you. 
actor dude is looking at Amy and he's just like, you so cute. I just want to kiss you in the mouth. And then mm. and then we're sitting there and then Amy's just like, and so at this point, we both are kind of shifting from side to side. And then she's like, um, and so, and I, so I start moving, but I'm just moving. And she starts talking through her teeth and she's just like, because you aren't leaving, are you? She's like, you're not. You are not leaving. And I go, no, I'm no. I mean, she's like, I know, because you're staying back here. And I go, I am staying back here. And so that's how I met her. And after that, I think I friended her on Facebook. And then, um, you know, whenever she would come to town, like I remember one time she was working at another club and um, she asked um, one of the comments on the show, you know Mia Jackson? And he's like, yeah. And she goes, is she in town tonight? Can you, do you have her number? Can you call her? And then so wow. he's like, Amy's here. So he brings her to the punchline and she's like, yay, how are you doing? She's like, we got to work together at some point. And so when I saw she was coming to town, I just hit her up and I was like, oh my God. I'm like, I would love to come you know, to the show, are you going to hang out or anything? She's like, well, do you just want to do a spot? And I'm like, oh, okay. So, yeah, but she's been really uh, helpful to me, too, just as far as, um, so, networking with her, I mean, because, like, I, I kind of already, you know, we already had each other's information, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, when I've needed stuff, I mean, and really, I don't need anything. It's just been more like advice, because even before I went to the show, I asked her, I'm like, well, I know you did it, so, you know, any advice? And she was just like, just have fun, because she was like, just know that you can't, you can't do anything about the outcome, so you just gotta do as well as you can do. And I was like, okay, cool. So she's been very helpful with stuff like that. Well, you're definitely, I have zero reservations saying you're the most prominent and most talented female comic coming out of Atlanta. You stop it right now. Oh gosh. <laughs> and I mean, Thanks, that's, Joel. that's the facts. That's why, that's why you're on here. And Amy Schumer is at the top of the game as far as female comics go, yeah, with everything she's yeah. doing. I mean, did she have any wisdom based on her experiences at the two levels? Um, you know, like I said, the, the biggest advice she gave me so far was the stuff about last comic. You know, just kind of being like, make sure you do this, make sure you do this, and they're gonna love you. It's gonna be great, you know. And then, and then I had a little management situation as well that she gave me some advice about too. So, mm -hmm. um, very, I mean, super helpful. Like, really. I can't even begin to say how helpful she was about that. But yeah, but super, super, super cool. I mean, just, you know, but just kind of, you know, I don't even think she'd have to tell me anything directly, but I think even just watching how she handles her career has been a, you know, a really cool thing to see just as a, as a female comic because it happens so much, you know, to where people are like, ah, oh, you're a chick comic, so I don't know what you're, are you going to have an attitude when you get on stage tonight? Are you going to do this? So it's really cool like to see somebody like her just going out and be like, I'm I'm a woman and I love the fact that I'm a woman and I'm gonna kick ass with it and I'm still gonna be funny and you're gonna respect me. And that you know, and I like that that she's able to to do that. So it just that is very inspiring. So, you know, seeing that as a she didn't have to tell me it's an inspiring thing to see to go, man, I like how she handles her career. And the trajectory she got on last comic standing and the kind of yeah, yeah, springboard from there, you see similar uh, trajectory with you? Um, you know, it, it would be nice to have a similar trajectory, but I also try to be very realistic about things as well, just because, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, because there are people who have been on the show where you're like, oh, that person was on Last Comic Standing. The end. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh -huh. you know, you have some people where you're like, man, this person went from Last Comic Standing, you know, she was what one of Time's influential people and all that kind of stuff. And then you got other people who, um, what was it? Um, you know, I know it's comics who were on there who, you know, went on to have Comedy Central specials and they went on to have sitcoms and all this other cool stuff, you know. So I think it's, um, I mean, I think a lot of stuff also has to do with timing. So we'll see what happens with timing. You know, we'll see if the world is ready for an adorable black lady. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're ready for that. <laughs> well, yeah, you not only being a female, but a black female. A black female, In the Joel, comedy game. In the comedy game. I mean, you, you grew up in Columbus, Georgia, in a black neighborhood. It's true. Um, it seems just based on observation, you tend to gravitate towards the white side of comedy. And I hate that, I hate that comedy is segregated like that, right. but it's hard to ignore. I mean, mm -hmm. and there are some comics who tend to only go towards their race or tend to go the opposite. I mean, do you find yourself wanting to branch out into the urban market at all, or are you comfortable in your lane? Uh, here, here's the thing, Joel. Uh, this is a this is an important thing that the world needs to know about Mia Jackson. Um, 
I'm black. You know what I mean? And I'm mm-hmm. very much well aware of that. Because I, I, I mean, this is real talk. I mean, like, real, like, I, I know people who are black comics who <clears throat> they would never do urban rooms. They would never do them. And, and there's also, I think sometimes you meet people who, and I hate saying things like this, but I think you meet people sometimes who are like, well, I'm black, but I'm also not, um, what's the word? Um, I don't have to be a black comic, that kind of thing. And I don't, I don't feel that way. I mean, I feel very much like I'm a black person. I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman that grew up in a black neighborhood with black parents and I went to black schools my whole life until I went to college. And I think, um, but to me, I I think for me, it's really more about what my comedic sensibilities are. I mean, and, and I don't think that I'm, it's not that I can't do urban or not that I won't do urban because I have, I've mm-hmm. done that kind of stuff before. Not, not a lot, but um, I think it's just when I started, I started off as a mainstream comic and I just kind of stayed in, in that world. But I mean, but growing up, like the comedy that I loved the most and what I watched the most, I mean, I grew up on Def Jam, you know, like that was the stuff that made me want to be a comic. Like I watched Def Jam all the time. I watched um, Comic View all the time. Like that's what I wanted to do. And then when I started, um, when I started getting interested in stand up in general, I mean, by that time, I think Def Jam was off the air. Uh, I think Comic View was still on. But then I just started watching stuff on Comedy Central, and I was just like, man, you know, I really like a lot of this stuff that I'm seeing on here. And it, you know, I like the, I like the writing. I like, you know, I like what I'm here, and I'm like, oh. I've never known this side of comedy really. And mm-hmm. so I, I kind of, you know, I was just like, okay. And so when I, but when I first started, I mean, I started off in like a mainstream open mic and I think it's just, it just so happened like, that's just where I started, you know, but mm-hmm. have I done urban shows? Yeah. Have I been booed? Yeah, you, I have been, I've mm-hmm. been embarrassed horrifically. <laughs> um, I have been, but then I've also had urban shows where people were like, I like you, you're different. And I'm like, okay, cool. I mean, I'm just, I'm just Mia Jackson. Would you say the experience of getting booed maybe made you apprehensive about going back? Hell no, it didn't make me apprehensive about going back. And no, no, because I mean, I, no, it didn't make me apprehensive at all. I think it's just, I think at this point I've done so much mainstream that I think that's just kind of where I am. But I mean, I'm okay with it. Like when I get in front of mainstream crowds, I still feel there's very much a responsibility of me as a black person to be like, well, I'm not going to be up here acting a complete fool for you guys. I'm not finna tap dance for you. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not doing that. Like, I'm gonna let you know that what I represent is, I represent me. You know, I represent my life. I represent my family. I represent Mia Jackson as a black woman that grew up in Columbus, Georgia, that graduated from the University of Georgia that has a degree in communications. And I like to read and I'm gonna do that stuff and I'm gonna talk about that stuff on stage, but it doesn't make me any less of a black person like I don't have to work an urban room and be like ooh you a black comic like I don't mm-hmm. have to do that I mean I can do it because like I said I've done you know and, and most of the time when I work um, quote unquote urban clouds if I do it I've done it more in like a church environment or I've done like um, like clean shows and things like that but I'm not saying that I don't identify with things because I mean I like as I grew up in I mean there are people in my family who lived in poverty. I stayed at those people's houses, grew in, you know, growing up, I, I stayed at my family's house. So I, I mean, it's like, I know the experience, you know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. I just think it's just that I just happen to gravitate towards more of a mainstream kind of thing. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I do hate the segregation of comedy. I hate that it's not a, and, <clears throat> but I can say that for any side, I think like for people who are just like, Oh, I'm alternative. I don't do that kind of comedy. I'd right. rather talk about killing puppies, you know, all right, if you like killing puppies, you know, this. you can not kill puppies and still be funny. But, I mean, I know people who are in the urban world who are like, man, I could never do mainstream rooms. Like, how mm-hmm. do you do that? Like, I would never do that. I mean, I'm cool with a lot of urban comics, you know, but I know people who are like, I would never. My comedy just won't translate, you know. But it, it kind of sucks. I mean, especially when I read historically about how all that stuff came to be in the first place because there was a time where there wasn't even technically an urban scene. You know what I mean? There was a time if you look at the comedy boom where you just performed, you just went to wherever you could tell jokes and then there's always been obviously an urban world or whatever. But I mean, I think as far as that being a whole um, 
genre of comedy. I mean, I think that was something that probably happened more like in the late 80s, early 90s kind of thing. And I think it's just a thing that's that stuck. But I don't, it, 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 it does bother me. It, it bothers me that, I mean, not for myself, that, but it just bothers me that, like, it's not a, like that the comedy scene is so segregated in general. Like mm-hmm. it, it really is just a troublesome thing to me. And it's like, well, why can't it just be everybody performing wherever all the time and it doesn't really matter? But, you know, the reality is that that's just not not the case. And you said it started late 80s, early 90s. Do you think oh, that was around uh, like the Def Jam? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like I said, if you if you read anything about... um you know, I mean, I've read a whole, I mean, I've, I read a lot. So just, um, I mean, I'm reading a book now uh, called uh, On the Real Side by um, Mel Watkins. And it talks about just the black comedy and not like, you know, not black comedy as a genre, genre but African-American comedy and African-American humor and, and just how that started from slavery through the uh, minstrel shows mm-hmm. to you know, the 60s and 70s into where, you know, Richard Pryor came out of that and then there's this big thing that happens and then it kind of coincides with the comedy boom too. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I do think that, um, um, I mean, because there's obviously a historical tradition behind it, but I mean, but I do think that urban as a genre probably got more popular like around the time there were things like Comic View and in Def Jam because there was a market for it, you know? I mean, because by that time, like, the, the big boom of the 80s was kind of over. So then you start having all those segmented markets of, all right, now we got alternative scene, now we have an urban scene, mm-hmm. now we have all these different things that have that have happened, so. So you've been, you've been in the comedy game for <clears throat> a minute now. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see these kind of segments, as you say, are there more and more popping up, or are we kind of starting to overlap each other? there's some overlap I think there's I think there's always been overlap I think there always will be um overlap but um I mean I think now if anything is popping up as its own separate segment or genre of comedy would be um anything that you see that's web-based you know Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube and Instagram and Vine so I think that's becoming its own separate thing but I mean but even in that though you still have people that are you know you got your more mainstream stuff. You got your more urban stuff. You might have your more alternative stuff. But I think that's kind of its own subgenre of comedy. You're an old school comic, but are you starting at a point now where you're like, all right, I need to get more of a web presence. I need to step my game I, up on you, that end. Because you know, it's it's weird. Because I actually started at a time where um, I I I started at a time where they were still sending out VHS tapes when I started comedy. Like, it mm-hmm. was like, you still, or, and then it was, and it was not so much, and then, then it was VHS to to DVDs. I mean, there, it was it was very, um, it was still, you mail actual DVDs to people, you mail actual VHS tapes to people, which, I mean, that was in 2002, 2003. So it was like, you would think we would have advanced a little bit <laughs> by that time. So, so I was, you know, I was around when people first started using MySpace to promote comedy because I remember, you know, people being like, have you heard of this Dane Cook guy? He uses this thing called MySpace. And I'm just like, what the heck is MySpace? And then all of a sudden, all these comics started using MySpace. And it was like, oh, use Facebook. And then people started using Facebook or use Twitter. So I was kind of, a, you know, around when I saw the whole transition from, oh, we're doing, you know, DVDs to, okay, well, now I can actually upload stuff online. And I remember having conversations with comics who started years before me who were like, oh, I'll never use this Facebook thing. I'll never use this Twitter thing. Mm-hmm. And that I'll, what is this crazy stuff? You know, so I think I started at a time to where I'm like, well, I knew a little bit about the old school, old school stuff, not all of it, but enough to where I'm like, well, I'm also young enough in it and young enough as a person to where I'm not against technology. So, um, um, whether 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 I mean yeah I think I mean web presence I do think is important now I mean because somebody should be able to find you because again even if you look at a lot of statistics you know most traffic especially among the African American community um, a lot of it's done mobile so um, when people are using Facebook when they're using Twitter when they're using Instagram most people are using it on their phones they're not using it sitting down at their computer so I do know that having a web presence is important I know having a website is important I know. Um, you know, trying to, 
and and, it, and I hate doing it. N not not even from being a old school comic, but I just hate doing it because I'm like, do I have to post pictures of things today? Like, mm -hmm. ugh, who cares? You know, like, does anybody really care about this stuff? But then I have to go. All right, I have to keep in mind that people are looking at their phones all day long. So yeah, let me post a picture. Let me put something on Facebook, or let me go and you know tweet. Let me do something just so that somebody knows I'm here because you do have to to interact with people. So do it's important. Do you think getting your face out on the social media side is more important than maybe moving to an L.A. or New York? Oh, uh, mm, I think L.A. and New York are still important. Like, I think, I think that, I mean, you have people who have, I think, become successful being where they are because, I mean, I can film a video right here and it could go viral. And that, that can still happen, but I do think, I think it's still important, like, to... I think LA and New York are still huge. It's just a matter of, as a comic, which one you're gonna decide to go to. Because if you wanna be a, you know, real deal stand up, go to New York. You know, if mm -hmm. you wanna be, you know, if you wanna do stand up and then do TV stuff, then you go to, you go to LA. So. Well, I know you have filmed TV in LA. Are you mm -hmm. leaning more towards LA? You know what? I, there was a time where I, I, um, I don't know where I want to go exactly. I mean, it was a time where I was like, man, I should probably go to L.A. because I'm adorable. Um, and then, <laughs> but then the past few months, I've gone to L.A. a few times. I've been like, I don't like being here. And I'm, I, don't, I don't like the traffic. I don't like the, it, I mean, it should not. I mean, Atlanta traffic is bad, but it should not take two and a half hours to get somewhere that is only 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Or 45 minutes away. That's just excessive. Mm -hmm. And it's hot. And there are just people everywhere. I'm like, why are you not home? Like, it is 1 o'clock in the afternoon. What are you doing right now? There's people everywhere in New York, too. But yeah, but they're not in cars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are. And, and New York does sometimes smell like pee. But um, I can live with a little pee. So New York. I mean, I, I don't, there's a part of me that I just, I don't know. I would... Mm -hmm. I would, I would, if I don't have to move, but I mean, if, if right now, I guess if I had to choose, I would, I'd probably lean more towards New York. I mean, I'm not against LA. I just don't think I could live there full time. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody said, Hey Mia, we have a TV show and you only have a tape and be here for six months. I probably could do that without running out into traffic. But, um, well, you had a timeline with quitting your job. You're like June 1st, mm -hmm. I'm quitting. Is there similar with? moving somewhere just set um, a timeline my only timeline with comedy is really based on my lease so if my mm -hmm. lease is up may 31st and i'm like i gotta make a decision by may 31st but if my lease is not up until then then no decisions are made but now you made me think about my life joel and i don't want to make any more deadlines well i know that's just the stand-up side i mean right. Is acting another <clears throat> venue you want to pursue? You know, here's the thing with acting. Um, I'm not an actress um, at all. I um, People have said to me before, like, oh, my God, you would be, like, a really good character. You could be a really awkward, ridiculous, nervous best friend because that's the kind of person you are in, in real life. And I'm like, I could, but then I'd have to remember lines. So if mm -hmm. I were to act, I'd only want to do commercials so that I could just do like one sentence and go, it sure is delicious. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I want to do. I don't want to have to know like full sentences. <laughs> right. Well, you definitely have, you, you have very high standards for yourself. I mean, moving forward, I mean, just think about Amy Schumer, how she has her own show now and she's a nationally touring stand-up. Is that kind of the paradigm you would like? If you were to do acting, it's my show, my rules. Uh, yeah, like if I were to, if I, I think if I were to do any kind of show, I would probably lean more towards like a talk show kind of thing because I do enjoy talking and harassing people, and uh, and I usually get people to admit things to me that they never plan on admitting. Not that I try to get them to do it, but I've been places before where I've had conversations with people and I'm like, oh, I didn't mean for you to tell me that. I remember having a conversation with this guy once, and he's just like, I ain't gonna lie to you, I cheated on my girl, and I was like. Whoa. Uh, and mm -hmm. I was like, we just really met two minutes ago. And I'm like, why are you telling me? He's like, and I feel so bad about it. And I just can't even believe it happened. And I go, why would you burden me with this? Mm -hmm. but, then, but then, but things like that happen to me all the time where, like, I said, people admit things to me. And I'm like, I'd probably be a really good talk show host because people just tell me stuff and I don't mean for them to tell me. And then I go, tell, and I'm, like, I'm talking to the guy, like, tell me more. Like, mm -hmm. why, why did you cheat on her? Are you sad? 
And then I'm like, why is he telling me this? I need to milk this for what it's worth. <laughs> so I think if I were to do something, I'd probably want to go more of a talk show kind of uh, route. Um, but I mean, my main thing is, like I said, I, if I were to do TV talk show, but then otherwise I would just want to, I don't want to travel. I would love to just go around doing stand up. I would love to like have a, you know, people who actually paid to see me as a, you know, to be like Mia Jackson. We love Mia Jackson like that. Cause I mean, and seeing, you know, and from having done the shows with Chappelle and doing the shows with Amy, it's like, man, this is their crowd. Like these people mm -hmm. love them. These people have come to see them. Like, I think that to me, that would be like a cool thing when somebody was like, I paid to see Mia Jackson. I don't know Mia Jackson, but I know her comedy, you know, versus, well, we came to the show because Mia's our daughter, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mia's my sister. Mm -hmm. I love Mia. We're going to go support Mia because we know her. It would be nice for somebody to go, man, I've been watching her for years, and that's, I love Mia. I just want to see what Mia has to say, so. Well, I love Mia Jackson. You know who I love? I love Joel Byers. Okay. And the world will soon know the comedy that is Mia Jackson. Is there anything else you want the world to know? Um, what I want the world one, I don't want anybody to judge me for my my statements that I made about um being an urban comic. <laughs> Cause I don't mean that in the, I don't want it, I'm not trying to start wars. I just I wanted to be clear that I started in mainstream and that's just kind of where I ended up. But I'm a black person. But beyond that, what I want people to know is that uh I am on the interwebs. I I can be found at miajackson.com. Um I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Mia Comedy. I'm also on the Facebooks. Um, there's a fan page that's comedian Mia Jackson, but yeah, so yeah, I'm on social media, all that good stuff, and so I'm always somewhere performing around town, doing something. So check me out, people. Check me out. I think I'm. I think I'm. I think I'm funny. Hopefully, you will too. Well, it's been my pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, Mia Jackson. Bye. Hot breath. Hot breath.